water's still coming in. Yeah. <laughs> let's just see. Let's just see how long it's standing. Here. Hey, have y'all seen John? If y'all seen John, tell him I'm looking for him. Oh, yeah, book of John. We're waiting for that last bus load that showed up. That's what we're... All right, let's give the Lord praise for Brittany Wright right back there. Brittany, Brittany handles our financials. Wave, wave, Brittany. There she is. All right. We can start now. They're, they're in. All right. Good day. Y'all stand and sing with us this morning.
morning, church. Uh, this morning we have one coming for baptism. Uh, he comes knowing that there's nothing special about this water that saves, but this is his first act of obedience and following Jesus as his Savior. This is Brian Darway. Uh, Brian shared with me that a little over a year ago, he and his family started attending services here with us. And it was, it was around that same time that he put his faith in Jesus. And he, he said he, you know, attended here over a year and there was just one service that God just put on his heart. He had seen over the, that year so many being baptized. And man, this is something that he needed to do as well. Uh, so he followed through in baptism, stands here this morning knowing Jesus as his Savior. And Brian, it is my joy, but my responsibility to ask you, who is Lord of your life? Amen. Brian, based on your profession of faith in Jesus as your Savior, I can baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's awesome. Brian, Brian married uh, one of our young ladies that grew up here in the church, and uh, so we're, uh, we're thankful. We're thankful for that. Hey, uh, sorry we're running late. Uh, the, uh, um, the Spirit of God just fell down in the last service, and we saw many folks come and surrender their life to Jesus Christ, and uh, a lot of other things that took place. And so, um, anyway, uh, just, just a great story. Uh, there, there, was this, there was this young couple that came during the uh, invitation and, um, and so I asked them what their name, names were, and she said, my name is, is Zoe. And I'm like, oh, do you, know what, do you know what that means? And she says, well, that means life. And I'm like, well, yeah, kind of. I said, bios means life. Zoe's a biblical word. It means abundant life. Tears start running down her face. And uh, I, I'll just tell you this, today... Zoe left here with Zoe, um, with abundant life. Let me welcome you guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. If you're a guest today, do us a favor. Fill out one of our guest registration cards. You can do it electronically. There'll be a slide that'll come up on the, uh, on the screen at the end of the service. So all you got to do is text the word guest to the phone number on the screen. Or you can find physical cards. They're kind of scattered throughout this room in the chair back pockets. You fill that card out, drop it in the offering bucket. Let us encourage you, if you've never come out to the Welcome Center, please do that today before you leave. It's right out there in the main lobby. There'll be folks out there, and uh, they'd love to get a chance to meet you, give you information, give you a free gift, answer any questions that you have about our church face-to-face. -face. Uh, my plan is to be out there um, uh, unless, you know, well, we're kind of praying that I can't get out there is what we're praying. That's what we're praying, because that means that we're seeing um, a, a lot of public decisions uh, for Christ. But uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here today. You know, we are blessed as a church that not only do we get to see, uh, see changes within our community as a result of the ministry of this church, but God uses this church all around the world. And one of the areas that he does that is in our online presence. And, um, you know, there's something that we started a couple of years ago that they've been on me for a while to start, and that is a podcast. It's called Unchangeable Truth. It is available on just about every platform that you can receive a podcast on. And what we do is uh, Ryan Tucker, who is our minister to young adults, he and I'll sit down on Monday, Tuesday, something like that, and we'll talk about the sermon and go even deeper in the sermon. Now, the first little bit, it's just two guys sitting in a closet having a conversation. I mean, literally, it's a small little room right up there at the top. And, um, we, you know, we have a little bit of fun and all that kind of stuff. But they came to me a while back and said, let's do that. Let's do a podcast. And I said, well, nobody would listen to a podcast uh, with me leading it or anything like that. Why would anybody want to do that? And uh, our podcast is listened to all over the world. It is crazy how God does that. And not only that, but we have folks that are worshiping with us this morning that are online, and that goes all around the world as well. And we have a kind of a regional television ministry. I can remember several years ago as well. Nobody watches TV. Let's don't do anything on TV. And 
that is a front door to our church. And there are folks that um, I consistently receive emails and stuff just saying, hey, I want you to know you, we've never met, but I was watching your service online, listening to you online. Or I was watching on TV or, um, I, or, you know, even now, folks, hey, I listen to the podcast. This is crazy, but one of the, one of the uh, biggest audiences that we have that listens to the podcast is in Seattle, Washington. And so I've even suggested that we have someone uh, maybe from that area of the country that can translate um, while I'm doing the podcast because, you know, I'm just a country boy. Uh, but anyway, and here's the reason why I bring all that up. Um, it is because of your obedience to Christ and your faithful giving that we have the resources to do all that we do. And there are so many things that we're able to be a part of that we may not get to see and hear the, the results of that here, but God says, I'm still using it in a mighty way. And I have no doubt that there will be people in heaven because of how God has used this church in non-traditional platforms. Because we, even though we get creative in a lot of areas, we don't have to get creative when it comes to the gospel. Because the gospel is the same. And so it's because of you that we are able to do this. Now, I know you guys don't give because of any tech or media ministry that we have. You guys give because, uh, you know, you, you want to honor God. You want to be obedient to him. He has richly blessed you, and you want to return a portion of that to him. But what happens is, and, you know, I just assume that we all give different amounts. I don't know. I, I, I only know what me and my family give, but I, I, I assume we all give different amounts. And so it's not about equal giving but it is about equal sacrifice. And so God takes all those amounts and he says, I'm going to use it to make much of Jesus through this church known as Highland Park. And so uh, anyway, I'd just like to remind you guys of how God uses our corporate giving to be able to take the gospel out. I'm going to ask our ushers to go ahead and come forward this morning. As we continue to worship by uh, taking up our tithe and our offering, you can place, place something physical in the bucket, whether that be a check or that be cash, or you can do text to give. You'll see it on the screen. It's really simple and it's really safe. Um, but let us just be faithful to do that. You know, the Bible says this, that if we give one cold cup of water in the name of Jesus Christ, he can use it to accomplish eternal things. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. Hey, I'll be the one that gives the water. I just don't want to give money. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm going to paraphrase some scripture. Can I do that? Okay, here, sure. Here's a Stephen Kyle paraphrase. You want to know where your heart is? Look where your money goes. That's an indication of where your heart is. Or maybe a better way to say it is this. Do you want to know if you have any idols in your life? Look at where you spend most of your money. I've had folks say, I just, I just, I just can't get to the place where I can tithe. Oh, friend, it's not about getting there. It's about saying, Lord, I'm going to honor you, and you'll be amazed. I was taught as a young, youngster by my own parents, as a follower of Christ, 90% will go a lot further than 100% every time. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can gather in this place. Thank you for what we've already been a part of and seen and heard in the first service. Jesus, if you never did another thing here at this church, what we've witnessed this morning has been worth it. But thank you that you're not finished yet. We ask your spirit to show up in this service and to speak to heart to heart. God, I could not even begin to imagine to know what's happening in the lives of everyone in this room, those that are watching outside of this room, but you know each need and each individual. So I pray that today, that just as you've done over and over again, that you would draw us close to you and that you would accomplish the miraculous and the eternal in our lives. God, we pray that you'd take the offering that we're going to give today and that you would use it to do things that are greater than any we could ever imagine. That God, if you could use two old boys just sitting and talking on a microphone through a podcast to change lives, you can do anything. So we ask you, Lord, do anything to draw men, women, boys, and girls to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you for showing us the example of giving. You tell us in your word, Father, 
that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And you also tell us in your word, Father, that Jesus came to give his ransom, to give his life for those that will believe. And so, Father, today, we give this back as a gift to you, as an indication. Our trust is in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, we praise you uh, this morning, Lord. We give you all the honor, all the praise, because you are the only one that is worthy of praise. Lord, thank you for the greatest gift of all, your son, Jesus. Lord, we can't comprehend why you would send your only son to save us, but Lord, we're so very thankful. This morning, Lord, uh, as we open your word, we just ask that you open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us, and Lord, we'll give you all the praise, all the honor. Lord, you're so great. In the precious, powerful, mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, would you help me to show your appreciation to our choir and instrumentalists and those that are a part? We, uh, we just take for granted. We show up each week, and they're going to hit a home run. And they do, uh, but there's a lot of work that goes into that. If you have a Bible this morning, please open it to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, you can see the title of the message is Saved and Sure, And we'll be looking at verses 22 through 29 of John chapter 10. While you're finding that text, let me ask you a question. And this is one of those questions I don't necessarily need you to answer out loud. But anyway, um, have you ever been kicked out of something? Maybe kicked out of a relationship, kicked out of a group, kicked out of a place. Have you ever been, um, well, have you ever been expelled from something? Um, I have. Uh, ma- matter of fact, I don't know, a few weeks ago, um, you know, you, you've, you've heard me say my son plays, uh, plays baseball, plays basketball at Mosley, and uh, it was their last basketball game of the season, and we were playing away. And uh, we were actually playing in the gym of a, uh, of a guy who's a really good friend of mine, a head coach. And, um, you know, the game was going, it was getting a little rough. If you've ever watched basketball, you know, you can kind of tell things are starting to get a little bit more uh, intense and some pushing and some talking and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so, so me and some of the other parents, you know, we kind of start telling the referees. We said, hey, listen now, you better get a hold of the game. 
It's going to get out of control. You better get, I mean, we didn't say it like that, but that's what we were saying. You better, better get a hold of the game. It's going to get out of control. And, uh, and sure enough, one of our players, he gets knocked to the floor, and uh, there were words that were exchanged, and then the, the kind of 12 players from their bench go out. You start seeing, uh, you know, punches getting thrown. And, uh, and so when, whenever this season, you know, I've been watching the basketball games and stuff, I'll usually sit next to a, a guy who's another kid plays on the team, and he's a Church of Christ uh, deacon. And so the Baptist preacher sitting to the, next to the Church of Christ deacon, and then next to us, or right in front of us, a lawyer who attends church here. And, you know, so, so it almost sounds like a joke. You have a Baptist preacher, a Church of Christ deacon, and a lawyer. They go to a high school basketball game, right? Well, as soon as it happened and you saw the, you know, the punches getting thrown, the Church of Christ deacon, he's, he's gone. He's down. He's on the court. I'm standing there. I'm kind of watching and, uh, you know, all of a sudden a basketball comes from the stands and it hits one of our players right in the face. And then that's when I engaged and, uh, and went down on the court. And, um, you know, we made sure everybody was kind of broken up and stuff. And, 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 and making my way back to uh, the bleachers, now I took the long way around, but making my way back to the bleachers, I just felt compelled. Now the Holy Spirit did not do this. I just felt compelled to let the referees, all three of them standing at half court that were not engaging in what was taking place, I felt the need to just let them know that um, I did not agree with their non-involvement. Actually, I said it this way. If, if you'd been doing your job, this never would have happened. <laughs> Maybe a little different tone. If you've been doing your job, this, this never would have happened. And by this time, the Church of Christ deacon is next to me, and he's like, I- I'll summarize what he said. Yeah, what he said. Okay? <laughs> and, uh, and then the ref said, you're gone to me. And then he said to the Church of Christ, you're gone to him. The lawyer ended up getting thrown out. The lawyer's wife got thrown out. And then our assistant baseball coach got thrown out. It'd be easy for me to tell you who didn't get thrown out versus who did get thrown out. Um, had to go to the principal's office. Not making this up. Had to go to the principal's office. Not there at that school. They threw me out. I was waiting outside in the parking lot after a, a couple of conversations in the hallway. I'm waiting outside in the parking lot. And, uh, you know, Jennifer is inside waiting on Reed. They stopped the game, waiting on him to come out of the locker room. And she's, she's like, well, where, where, where'd he go? Where's Stephen? Where, where'd he go? And, you know, she's asking, where, where's Stephen? And where's Stephen Kyle? Do you know where Stephen Kyle is? And somebody said, well, yeah, he threatened a police officer. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, Pastor Stephen Kyle threatened a police officer. Yep, yep, yep. I, that's why they kicked him out. And, uh, and eventually she found me, and she's like, I heard you threatened a police officer. And I said, I would not be standing here right now if I'd threatened a police officer. Um, but I got kicked out. And then ha- the next week, had to go to the principal's office at our school. And it's been 30 years since I've been to the principal's office. Actually, it's been 40 years since I've been to the principal's office. And I said, okay, I've been to hundreds of games here. I've never gotten thrown out of any of them. And uh, I can tell you right now that I'll... I'll, I'll never do that again unless the same thing happens. And then, and then I'll be there. When, when the fight broke out, Jennifer, Jennifer looked and Reed was at one end of the court away from the fight. And she's like, okay, whew, he's not involved. And she said, I just blink my eyes and I look and he's right in the middle of all of it. Um, because we've, we've, we've kind of taught, hey, listen, if your teammate is in peril, you go to the teammate's rescue, and we'll figure out later what it was all about, but you go to your teammate's rescue. He would have gotten in trouble at home had he remained standing where he was. But I got thrown out. Some of you have heard that. Some of you heard I spent nights in jail. Some of, some of, you, some of you heard I'm starting a prison ministry. I mean, you know, all kinds of things. But I got thrown out. I was ashamed. I got thrown out, me and all my friends. I didn't think they were rowdy, but they are. <laughs> and here's the reason why I bring that up today. It's not, it's not me, quote, coming clean, okay? It's not, nothing like that. A lot of folks view the Christian life as something that you can get, get thrown out of. 
that maybe if you don't behave a certain way or maybe, maybe if you say the wrong thing that you're going to get ejected just like you've been thrown out of a relationship or a club, whatever it may be. I can remember several years ago I was doing the funeral for a faithful member of our church. And, I mean, this guy just served the Lord. He had Jesus all over him. And uh, as my custom is, you know, I met with the family before the service, and I'll just say a short little prayer with them before we go into the service. And I just made a statement. I said, you know, um, this guy was, man, he loved Jesus so much. Uh, We know exactly where he is, and we'll all have the chance to see him again one day. And a family member from out of town said, well, we really don't know where he is. All right, maybe, maybe, actually, here's the way he said it. Well, we really can't know where he is. And we can't know where he'll be. I mean, we can't know that we'll be in heaven. We've got to persevere to the end. And uh, I didn't get into a debate with him. I'm like, well, yeah, we can. We can know. (laughs) We can know. I believe he is in heaven. We can know that we'll see him again one day. And um, because of the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And it was awkward. And I wasn't going to debate. I wasn't going to argue. So I just kind of prayed. And, and, and we did the service. And afterwards, one of the family members came to me and said, Hey, I want to apologize. He's from out of town. He's a part of a, uh, a Christian denomination that believes you can lose your salvation. And I said, Hey, no worries. I said, But just know this. You can see your dad again. And you can know that you will. That's what Christ is talking about here. He's talking about not having a hope-so faith. He's talking about having a no-so faith. And in John chapter 10, it actually teaches that we, if we're a part of God's flock, we'll always be a part of his flock. Once his lamb, always his lamb. Don't take my word for it. Let's see what God's word has to say. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 22, all the way down to verse 29 And listen to what it says there. It says, now, it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem. Now, let's just stop right there. The Feast of Dedication is the holiday that our Jewish friends celebrate around Christmas time today, known as Hanukkah. It's also known as the Festival of the Lights. Uh, The reason why they celebrate this is they commemorate what happened back in 164 B.C. when the Jews reclaimed and they rededicated the temple after the temple had been defiled by the Greeks. Okay, so I, I think it's interesting here. While they were celebrating the festival of lights, they missed the fact that the light of the world was right in front of them. Mm. Look with me. It was the festival of dedication in Jerusalem and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. And then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you're the Christ, if you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you're not of my sheep as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. The Jewish leaders here, they were pressuring Jesus. Tell us plainly, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Look at what he said. Look at the miracles. Look at what I've done. Are are you blind? Oh, wait. You are blind. Because you're not my sheep. Because my sheep hear my voice, recognize my voice, and they follow me. The reason why you don't recognize me is because you're not a part of the sheepfold. You're not a part of the family of God. And then Jesus gives, church, one of the most powerful statements about assurance of salvation, about the eternal security of a believer that we find throughout Scripture. That the words that he spoke, he knew we'd be sitting here today, walking through the book of John, discussing these words today, telling us that a person can know with certainty that they're truly saved. And once you're saved, you can't lose that salvation. 
It is in Jesus Christ. Let me illustrate it this way. Uh, many, many years ago, like in 1933, they started construction of the uh, Golden Gate Bridge across the San Francisco Bay. It was a controversial uh, construction project because they'd never done anything like that before. But all the construction projects they'd done, when they estimated you know, the scope of it and the, the finished product, they estimated that 35 workmen would fall and die. The first few months, 11 fell into the water and died. They perished. That was way ahead of schedule. They were figuring out, they're like, if if this continues happening at this rate, we're going to lose more workmen than we even estimated. So they halted the project. We can't keep working like this. There's too many men dying. And then one of the engineers, one of the designers said, I don't know what we should do. Let's string a net below the construction surface. They spent $100,000. You're like, well, that's nothing. Well, if that's nothing, I want to hang out with you. (laughs) Today, that would be over $2 million to bring a net in and to string it along the bottom of where they were constructing and working. And you know what happened? Men continued to fall, but they fell into the safety of the net. They crawl out of the net, they'd go back up and they'd start working again. You know, at first they said, there's no way that we can spend this kind of money. I mean, that'll make us way over budget. But what happened is, once they strung this safety net below where they were constructing this bridge, the workmen started working faster. They had confidence in their work because they knew if we fall, we don't have to worry about dying. The net will safely catch us. And listen, They finished ahead of schedule, and they finished under budget, even spending the money that they spent on that net. When they interviewed workmen about the project, they said that the presence of the net gave them more confidence in their work, and it led to greater efficiency. And the reason why I bring that up today, based upon what we've read in the Word of God, is it can be said the same of the Christian life. That when you know that you are saved, when you know and you have assurance that you will spend eternity with Jesus Christ, then all of a sudden you have this confidence, right, to serve the Lord and to serve the Lord with gladness. I'll say it this way. It is a blessing to be saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's a greater blessing to be saved and to know that you're saved. I want to give you five reasons this morning. Five reasons. You're like, that's why they got out late. Five reasons. No, we went into the invitation way on time. Five reasons why you can have assurance of your salvation. Now, I want to make some points clear before we start digging into this, or a couple of statements. When we use the word salvation, because we have a lot of people every Sunday that come to these services that have never been a part of a church, we're using Christianese, church lingo, and you're like, I don't have a clue what they're talking about. We're going to be using the word saved today, and the fact that everyone needs to be saved. You're going to say, saved? I didn't even know I was in danger. What do you need to be saved from? Your sin and the results of your sin. You see, we're all sinners, every single one of us. I don't say some are you know, better than others. I'll just say this, some are better sinners than others. But we're all sinners. And so there's a judgment of our sin. What is the judgment of our sin? It means that we'll be separated from God for all eternity in a literal place called hell. There are folks that say, well, that's symbolic. That just represents separation from God. No, hell is a real place. Jesus talked twice as much about hell as he did heaven. It is a real place. It is a place of torment. It is a place of destruction. There's no way that I can even verbalize to you just how damning hell is. And so because of your sin, the judgment is separation from God forever in hell. Not only that, but destruction in life because you have no hope and you have no peace. You see, 
What I, when we use the word saved, we use the word salvation today. What we mean is those that have been saved from the judgment, right? From the condition of their sin. They've surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. Their faith and hope are in him. And now they have received this salvation. They have been saved. So what I'm about to give you today, these five reasons why you can have assurance of your salvation, only can be claimed by those that are saved. Now, the good news is this, that while you may not can claim them now, I know of at least six people that could claim them at the end of the last service, and you can as well. So reason number one, right? Reason number one why we can have assurance of our salvation, the promise of God. It's what God promises. Matter of fact, look back in verse 29 there in Luke or John chapter 10. These are the very words of Jesus, and they're very, very important. He said in verse 29, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. So God the Father has presented to this good shepherd, has presented to Jesus his sheep. I hate to use this illustration because, again, I think, I think we try to humanize God so much. But picture with me God sitting there and God saying to Jesus, God saying to the good shepherd, Son, I'm giving you these lambs. They are yours. I am also giving them eternal life. They shall never perish. They shall always be yours. They will recognize your voice. That once God has presented you to the good shepherd, and there are some that are saying, well, you're removing, you're removing personal decision. You're removing personal accountability. Not at all. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that God has created some for hell and some for heaven. I'm not saying that God has created some for glory and some for damnation. I am just saying this, that those that receive that gift of salvation, God says, I've presented these to you. God knew ahead of time who would do it, who would not do it. You say, that's the sovereignty of God. 100% is the sovereignty of God. You say, free will robs God of sovereignty. I'm saying free will, if anything, magnifies the sovereignty of God. Let's don't even get into that. Some of you are like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Good, good, you're blessed. I'm just saying, listen to what it says here. Once God's given you to the good shepherd, he makes a promise. There's nothing that can separate you from his love. Nothing. Matter of fact, listen to Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. The apostle Paul is nailing down this very promise of God. Listen to it. Romans 8, 38 and 39. He wrote, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Say amen this morning. Death cannot separate you when you're in the fold. When you're part of the body of Christ, death can't separate you. Matter of fact, here's what he said. I've chosen to give life out of death. That if you're in Jesus Christ, the moment you take your last breath here, you're in the very presence of him. But life can't separate you either from the love of God. Because why? Because we're living right now in a loving relationship with God by faith. He says there are no angelic powers, there are no demonic powers, there are no human powers that can separate you from the love of God. Somebody needs to hear this today. Open up your ears. Listen to what I'm about to say. Your past, hello, your past can't separate you from the love of God. Your future cannot separate you from the love of God. The present cannot separate you from the love of God. It cannot remove you from that connection. Nothing is tall enough. Nothing is deep enough. Nothing is wide enough to hide you from God's stubborn love. <clears throat> There's a song recent last couple of years the reckless love of god we don't we don't sing it here 
the reckless love of God. I, I don't think the song maker or songwriter probably intended it the way that, that I hear it and I receive it. Because when I think of God, there's nothing reckless about him. There's nothing, now there's a lot of things reckless about me. Hey, look, there's a snake in the pool. Pick it up by the tail. That's reckless. Stopping at half court and telling the ref what you thought about it, that's reckless. I like the word stubborn. The stubborn love of God. The long-suffering love of God. The patient love of God. The eternal love of God. God's promise is secure. Oh, God's promise is as secure as God himself. And the only way his promise will not last for all eternity is if we wake up in the morning and there is no God. The great British preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon, I want you to hear what he wrote. He wrote, God cannot go back on his word. His promises are like checks he has written to us. All we need to do is endorse them with faith and then present them to heaven's bank for payment. The promise of God. That's the first reason you can have assurance of faith. But then there's a second reason. That is the perseverance of the Spirit. You're like, well, hang on just a second. It's the perseverance of the saints. And I'm with you. I go with you on that doctrine. But I don't like that terminology. I like the terminology, the perseverance of the Spirit. And here's why. Because I, when I think of eternal security, it's not up to me. It's not up to you to persevere. Because the Holy Spirit, who lives inside of those that are a part of the family of God, right, is going to persevere as he molds us into the very likeness of Jesus Christ. It's the perseverance of the Spirit. Paul expressed it, Philippians 1.6, we'll have it on the screens. I want you to hear what Paul says in Philippians 1.6. He says, I am sure of this. There you go. What's he sure of? That he, who's he? That's the Holy Spirit of God. He, oh. He who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He's going to finish what he starts. Now, the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, first of all, convicts you, convicts you of sin, convicts you of the fact that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. So the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. The Holy Spirit converts us to Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be born of the Spirit. That's when we get saved. And then he will complete what he's doing. You ever started something that you, you didn't finish? Sure you have. I drive by some of your houses. <laughs> How long does it take to build a wall? <laughs> Do you know God's never started anything he's not finished? Ever. So here's what that means. One of the reasons I can be sure of my salvation, that I can put trust and faith in the fact that what I surrendered to him, the day that I trusted him as my Savior, right, my soul to him, that he was, is safe and secure with him. He will, he will have it there. It's, 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 I've, I've committed it to him for all eternity is the very fact that the Spirit will persevere. The Spirit is working in my life. Here's the way we say it. I'm not who I, who I used to be, right? I'm not who I want to be, but he's not finished with me yet he's working he's moving right he's transforming within my life and he's not going to stop working on you i heard about two elementary school boys billy and jimmy and billy told jimmy one day on the playground hey look my dad has a list of all the men in this town that he can whoop and your daddy's on the list. Jimmy went home and he said, Dad, Billy said that his dad's made a list of all the men that he can whoop in this town. And your name's on the list. He said, really? And so he went over to their house. Rang the doorbell. His dad came to the door. And he said, listen, your son told my son that you've got a list of all the men in this town that you can whoop. And that my name is on the list. And he said, that's exactly right. And he starts rolling up his sleeves. 
And he says, I don't think you can. What are you going to do about that? He said, I'm going to take you off my list. That's what I'm going to do right now. I'm gonna... <laughs> you won't be on that list anymore. Hey, the good news is, once you're on God's list, he's not going to take you off his list. There's nothing you can do to forfeit that. He will never, ever remove you. And what he has just said here, what I've started in you, the day that he saved you, I will bring to completion. It's not over yet. He's not done with you yet. He's working in your life. So one of the reasons that you can have, you can have security, assurance that you're saved is the very promises of God. The second one is the perseverance of the Spirit moving and working, sanctifying you in life. And there's a third reason, and that's the position of a believer. Once you are saved, God now places you in a new position. What is that position? It's a phrase. It's two words. In Christ. In Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Look at the screens. I want you to look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any person, here it is, is in Christ, they are a new creation. Did you know the phrase in Christ, in him, in the Lord? It appears 164 times just in the letters of Paul themselves. And so the very glorious truth about salvation is if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, you and I are in Christ. And listen, Christ is in you. Second Peter draws an analogy there. Second Peter, he's sitting there and he's writing and he's talking about the story of Noah and the ark. He says, hey, listen, the story of Noah and the ark is a metaphor for our salvation. Many of you know how the story of Noah and the ark goes. You know, God is sitting there and God has said, listen, I've, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring judgment on the earth because of the sin of mankind. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause it to rain and flood and, you know, everyone is going to perish. But Noah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and I want you to build this boat. I want you to build this ark and I, I, I'm going to save you and I'm going to save Mrs. Noah and I'm going to save your three sons and their wives. And so here's what I want you to do. Build this massive boat and then inside that boat, because there's eight of you, I want you to drive eight wooden pegs into the side of that boat so when it gets really, really rough and it starts raining and the boat gets tossed to and fro, you won't fall out of the boat. Hold on to those pegs. Amen? Don't say they didn't happen that way happen that way some of you are like I I didn't remember that part (laughs) now I always find it humorous you've heard me say this God's judgment reigning on the earth destruction everyone was killed except Noah and his family hmm let me decorate my baby's nursery and Noah and the ark well here's the reason why you do it wasn't God saying hey You better grab something and hold on because you're going to fall out. No, no, here's what God said. God said, hey, go in the boat. Scripture even says this, God, shut them up in the boat. You think they maybe stumbled around a little bit when the waves were raging? I can only imagine so. I mean, my goodness, they got all those animals and all that kind of stuff in there. You think think on Noah might have slipped every now and then? Yeah, but he he didn't have to worry about falling out of the boat. Because he was in the boat. The boat kept the water on the outside and safely kept Noah and his family on the inside. And so Peter in 2 Peter says, you guys have missed it. (laughs) It didn't have anything to do with a guy building a boat and water coming down, even though that literally happened. But the reason why that happened is this. Jesus is the boat. When you're in Jesus, yeah, yeah, yeah. You may slip a little bit. You may fall down. But you'll not fall out of Jesus just like Noah didn't fall out of that boat. Colossians 3. It's a powerful image of how safe you are in Christ. Colossians 3, 3. Hear what Paul wrote. He said, for you died. Colossians 3, 3. Can we get Colossians 3, 3 on the screens? Are they, are, they, 
Are they messed up, Scott? Take my word for it. <laughs> Colossians 3.3. 3. For you died. You died what? Not physically. For you died to your selfish pursuit. You died to yourself. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. There is a double security there. You are hidden with Christ in God. I'll explain it this way. Think of Christ like this lockbox, right? So now that you're in Christ, your soul, you, your being is taken and it is placed inside that little drop box or that little lockbox and they, 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 they lock it up and then they take the little lockbox and they place it inside this bigger, massive safe, which is God. And so you've got double security there. I'm in Christ, and I'm also in God. You're safe and secure. Why? Because with Christ, you're hidden in God. I'm just saying that's the position of a believer. That's the reason that you can have assurance of your salvation. Because God promises. Because the Spirit will keep you. He will persevere. Because you are now a new position. You're now in Christ. Let me give you a fourth reason. The prayer of Jesus. We'll eventually come to John chapter 17. And in John chapter 17, we're going to see the prayer that Jesus prayed the night before he went to the cross. And this is very interesting. What do you think he was praying about before he went to the cross? He was praying about you. He was praying about you. In John 17, verse 24, he mentions those of us who have been given to him by his Father. And listen to what it says in John 17, 24. He says, Father, I want those you've given me to be with me where I am so that they will see my glory which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. Jesus is there. Jesus is praying. And what is his prayer? He's praying, Father, those that you've given to me, I pray, will always be with me. He was praying for our salvation. And friend, I want to tell you something. You may think God may not answer your prayers, but he always answers the prayers of Jesus. And not only did he pray that night 2,000 years ago, but the Bible says this. He is praying for you if you're a part of his fold, a part of his sheep, right now. Moment by moment, day by day, year by year. He ever lives to make intercession for his sheep. L listen to this. This is in Hebrews 7 verse 25. Hebrews 7, 25, therefore he, Jesus, therefore Jesus is able to save completely. Though, oh, I'm thankful it says completely, not partially, not momentarily. He is able to save completely those who come to God through him since he always lives to intercede for them. So the only way that I could lose my salvation, the only way that I could be in Christ and now I'm out of Christ, somebody's going to have to go to heaven and they're going to have to say, Jesus, quit praying for Stephen's salvation. Jesus, quit praying that Stephen Kyle is going to always be with you. And here's what I just assume. You get to heaven, you're not going to tell Jesus to quit praying. Do you see the power in the statements that we see all throughout the Word of God? There are people that sit there and say, oh, you know, security of the believer, that's a Baptist thing. No, friend, it's not a Baptist thing. It's a biblical thing. It's a gospel thing. There are folks that sit there and say, I believe that you can be in, you can be out. You can be a part of the sheepfold. You're not a part of the sheepfold. You can be saved. You can be lost. And here's what I always ask them. What is the line of demarcation? At what point do I step from being in Christ to now I'm out of Christ? And then I'll even offer some suggestions. What about murder? If somebody murders someone, then now they're not in Christ, right? Exactly. No way a murderer can be saved. I'm like, okay. Are we living in Old Testament or New? Because remember what Jesus did in the New Testament? He said, hey, I, I, I know you've heard that you should not murder anyone. Let me go ahead and tell you, if you had hatred in your heart for someone, you're guilty of murder. You're like, oh, I've never had hatred for anyone. You liar. <laughs> I 
Hey, brother, I'm preaching this, not you, okay? <laughs> One of our deacons, Mitch. I know, I know, I can hear, I can hear that voice anywhere. <laughs> Adultery. Yeah, and what he say? If you had lust for anyone, you're guilty of that. I'm just saying, he takes it to a whole new level. He takes it to a whole new level. And so there is no stepping in and stepping out. The only way that I can lose my salvation is for Jesus to say, I'm just going to stop praying for you. But we are eternally safe just as the prayers of Jesus are. Promise of God, perseverance of the Spirit, position of a believer, the prayer of Jesus. Let me give you the last one. The power of God. Here's what that means. That means, guys, you've heard me say this if you've been around here for any amount of time. It's not about you and I holding on to God. It's not how powerful can we grip God, but it's how powerful can God grip me? How well can God hold on to me? Jesus here in our text, he spoke one of the most powerful verses in all the universe. He's speaking here about his father's hand. And listen to the force that he mentions. This is verse 29 of John 10. He said, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Now stop and think about that. The most powerful force in the universe, the very hand, the very hand of God. I used to use this illustration. Whenever I would preach or teach on this text, I would have a quarter in my hand and I would say, this quarter represents, this quarter represents my soul. This quarter represents my being. This is my hand and it's a strong hand. And to illustrate what this is talking about, I would usually have a child come out of the congregation and I would select a young child to make sure they couldn't pry it out of my hand. And I would have them go on the stage and I would say, okay, try to take this quarter out of my hand. And they wouldn't be able to do it. And I would say, see, just as powerful as I'm holding this quarter, God powerfully is holding your soul in his hand. And then one time after the service, this little boy comes up that I had done the illustration with and he said, hey, I couldn't pull it out of your hand, but I brought my dad. He wants to try. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, no. You know, no, no, that's not the illustration. <laughs> and then I thought, you know, I better quit using that. Because even though, even though that kid's not powerful enough, that dad was clearly powerful enough. But uh, can I share a verse that God, mm, listen to this, listen. Isaiah 49, 16. Mm. It's not our soul in God's hand. Look what it says. God says, look, I have engraved your name in the palm of my hand. It's, 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 it's not him. It's not him holding. You're like, oh, it's, it's like he's tattooed it. He's tattooed my name. Right in the palm of his hand. I don't have a tattoo. Some of you guys have tattoos. I dare say most of you in this room have a tattoo. I've decided I'm going to be rebellious and not get a tattoo. You know? You're like, well, does me having a tattoo, does that mean I'm going to go to hell? Not at all. Not at all. Looks like you took a tour of hell. It doesn't mean you're going there. <laughs> Well, I got scripture right here on my arm. It's a, it's a verse of scripture. I put it right here on my arm. And I'm like, well, it, it doesn't say put it on your arm. It says hide it in your heart. I mean, but anyway, I mean, just, that's my personal opinion. Okay. Okay. I don't need emails debating. I know the scripture. Okay. You can. Absolutely. I'm just not going to do a tattoo. You're like, okay, so my, so my name, when I get saved, my name is tattooed right on the palm of his Hand. You know, this is interesting. I looked this up. I don't know if it's true or not, uh, but maybe Google says it is. The, um, that, that, you know, that they can use lasers and everything to permanently remove tattoos to get them to the point where you can't even recognize you had a tattoo. I don't know. Maybe you, some of you have walked through that before. Um, I did read this, that if like your your, if your third cousin's the one who tattooed you in the back seat of a car, that'll come off a lot easier than a professional tattoo artist. 
The word's not tattoo. Engraved. Mm, Here's what it means, guys. It's not that God, when you get saved, it's not that God is sitting there and holding you in his hand. And no one can come along and pry his fingers loose and take you out of his hand. Now that's true. The powerful hand of God, I promise you, there's no daddy or anybody that can come along and pry his fingers open. But let's just say, let's just say that some reason he lost his grip, right? Some reason he didn't realize just how rambunctious you were when he saved you. He didn't realize how slippery sinfully you would be there's nothing to drop he's not holding you in his body you've become his body you are engraved in the palm of it the moment that you receive Christ you've now become a part of the body of Christ. I want you to hear what Peter says. This is in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. He says, you are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So it's not a matter of us holding on to God. It's a matter of God keeping us. Because once we are a part of his family, we can no longer become not a part of his family. He's given us to Jesus. Jesus says, my sheep, my sheep, they recognize my voice. They hear my voice. They follow him. We know him. And he gives us eternal life. And he says, you shall never, ever perish. That the Father has given you to Jesus. And nobody can take what's been engraved off of his hand. So let me ask you this question. We gotta, we gotta hurry up. So have you ever seen a Christian who lost their salvation? Don't answer. Who lost their salvation? You're like, I have. I have. Okay, I'm gonna ask you another question. Just to see if you guys how well you remember, because I've done this before. How many of you have ever seen a falling star? Raise your hand. Falling star. Falling star. Okay, good deal. You're wrong. No shame in that. Do you know there's no such thing as a falling star? It's a falling meteorite. If a star fell to earth, we'd know it. It wouldn't be like you, you know, you remember you dating your wife in high school and you're driving down the road and you're like, oh, look, there's a falling star. We're going to be together forever. (laughs) And then you get married 20 years later, you're driving down the road and there comes a falling star and you're like, look at that fireball from heaven. That says this is not good. (laughs) It's a meteorite. Entering our atmosphere and it gets on fire and we say, well, it's a, it's a falling star. No, it's not a falling star. You say, well, now hang on. My grandmama said it was a falling star. <laughs> I read it somewhere that it is a falling star. I heard it in a country, country music song. Doesn't make it so. Now I'm going to go back to the original question. Have you ever seen a Christian who lost their salvation? Here's the deal. They weren't a Christian. Because he's just made it very clear. And I've gone throughout the entire Bible giving you verse after verse after verse after verse. Once you're in the sheepfold, you're not out of the sheepfold. You're in the body. Your name's engraved on his hand. You say, well, I saw someone, and they used to say that they were a follower of Christ. They used to show up at church every time the doors were open. They used to be faithful to their spouse, and they just loved the Lord, and they came to our Bible study group, and then all of a sudden they recanted it all, and they walked away from Jesus. Jesus and they lost their salvation. No, they never had it. They were never a part of the sheepfold. Because the the real sheep, they hear his voice. They recognize it. And they follow him. So the very power of God 
It's this eternal security that allows us to live with confidence in the very finished work of Christ. There's a song that we sing here. It is known as a modern hymn. One of my favorites. I don't know why they call it a modern hymn. I guess because it has verses and choruses and it was written within the last 20 years. But it's a favorite. In Christ alone. You guys know that song? We sing it pretty regularly around here. I I want you to listen to this verse. I love this verse, okay? No guilt in life. Now stop and think about that. He's singing here about the benefits that belong to those that are in Christ. No guilt in life. There's some of you that have come this morning to the service, and here's what you're thinking. Man, I need a guilt remover. Man, because here's what happens. Guilt turns into shame. Shame turns into condemnation. And you walk in here this morning with your head beat down, right? You walk in here and, I don't know, maybe last night or something, you're just sitting there and you're like, I just feel so guilty. I just feel so shameful. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I should go to church and, and maybe we can sing something or I'll hear something. And it'll just make me feel better and it'll remove this guilt. You don't need a guilt remover. You need a Savior. No guilt in life. No fear in death. Oh. What? No fear in death? Have you guys ever been? Have you ever been beside the bed of someone that is in Christ? And death was a glorious thing. I'll never forget as a young, young preacher, one of the very first hospital visits I ever made, I walk into the room. There's an elderly lady laying in the bed. I didn't know if she was asleep. I didn't know if she was dead. I had no idea. I wasn't going to wake her up. So I just walked up next to her, and I'm like, okay, they told us in seminary, just pray, you know. And so I'm walking up, and I'm just praying, you know, in the strong name of Jesus Christ, Lord, get her up out of this bed and heal her body and get her back home. And all of a sudden, her eyes opened up, and she grabbed my hand, and oh, God, oh, almost died right there she grabbed my hand and she looked at me and she pulled me real close and she said quit praying me out of heaven I'm ready to go (laughs) and I said yes ma'am I'll see you in glory because I'm not coming back to this room (laughs) no guilt in life No fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. Mm. Actually, actually, hang on. That wasn't my favorite part of the song. This is my favorite part of the song. No power of hell, no scheme of man will ever pluck me from his hand. <laughs> what, what am I singing that in, Corey? What, what note is that? Is that? Where, where would I be up there? Would I be a, what, what would I be? I would be a soprano? Okay. Not a tenor? Okay, all right. Hmm. I'll drop it down. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Hey, do me a favor. Would you just bow your heads with me right now? Bow your heads. Close your eyes. I'm going to ask them to leave the lights up. And ask no one to leave. A good number of you in this room can say, Man, I am saved and I'm sure. I have eternal security because I'm in Jesus. Could I, could I, just, could I just ask you this? When's the last time you said, thank you, Lord, that I'm saved and I'm sure? Or maybe, maybe I chose the wrong word. Maybe it should be this. Thank you, Lord, that I'm saved 
and secure. When's the last time you said thank you? Thank you. And then there are others in this room that would say, you know what, the reality is this. I'm not sure. I have no security. The reality is I'm kind of like that guy at that funeral. You, you really can't know, can you? Well, I've shown you all throughout God's Word that you can know. It's the very gift that God gives to those that surrender their life to Him. Just like this young lady that I shared with you earlier. Her name's Zoe. Abundant life. And I ask her, so if today you were to die, do you know that heaven would be your home? And her response was, I'm just not real sure, but I sure do want to know. Maybe that defines you today. And if today you've come to the point where you say, I'm ready to surrender my life to Jesus. I'm ready to receive that gift of grace and mercy. I just don't know how. But the very fact that you would even say that within your heart is a great indication that God's working on you. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, you'll be saved. If you're here today and you say, I'm ready to do that, with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, I'm going to invite you to call out to Jesus. Now please hear me. There's not a single prayer in this world that can forgive sin. Not one. There's nothing magical or mystical. There's no right, proper words to say. It is not the wording of a prayer. It's the subject and the object of that prayer. Jesus, that forgives sins and gives eternal life. Remember what I told you? For over 2,000 years, he's been praying that you'd be saved. He's praying right now for your salvation. If you're here today and you say, I'm ready to surrender to Him, could I invite you to do this? Right inside your heart. You don't have to pray it out loud or you can pray it out loud. But right inside your heart. And this is how how I surrendered to Jesus. I prayed. You do the same. Jesus, I am a sinner. And Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I'm putting my faith and trust in you. That I believe you're God's son. I believe that you lived, you died, but I believe you rose again. And you're alive right now. Jesus, I can remember praying this as a nine-year-old boy. Little church in North Mississippi. Jesus, I I want to follow you all the days of my life. Is that your heart's desire today? Did you pray that and mean that with all your heart? Your head's still bowed, your eyes still closed. Here's what I want to do. If today you prayed and give your life to Jesus Christ and you surrendered that to Him, settled once and for all, I'm not going to come to you, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I am going to ask you to do this. Would you raise your hand? You prayed it. You meant it. You've surrendered your life to Jesus. Just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Yes. Raise your hand. Anybody? Yes. You prayed. Give your life to Jesus today. And you surrendered to him. Anyone else? Raise your hand. Yes. Yes. Okay, with your head still bowed, your eyes still closed. Again, I'm the only one looking around. I'm dare not going to come to you. I never want to embarrass you. You've raised your hand. I want to invite you to do this. I want to ask you to do this. Would you just lift your head up and look at me? You raised your hand. Lift your head up and look at me. Did you mean that? Did you mean it? You meant it? It's your heart's desire to surrender to Jesus? Yeah. Look at me. Today you have been a glorious recipient of the grace of God. And just as he welcomes you into the sheepfold, you'll always be a part of the sheepfold. It's not about you holding on to that peg. It's about you're now engraved on the palm of his hand. 
For those who raise their hand, look at me. We're about to stand. There are going to be pastors all down front. There are going to be pastors and staff and encouragers at the doors. You told me you meant it. Today you gave your life to Jesus. You meant that? When we stand, I'm going to ask you to come. Go to one of these people at the door. Come down here to one of these pastors and say, Today I've surrendered my life to Jesus Christ and I'm not ashamed. You're like, Pastor, boy, that's that, a little scary to walk in front of all those people. Oh, friend, hear me. What a great celebration it'll be for those who get to witness you saying, I'm not ashamed. I give my life to Jesus. We're not going to ask you to talk. We are going to talk with you and pray with you. But I'm going to ask you when we stand, you just come. Those of you who raised your hands, lifted your eyes, we've talked. You're going to come, okay? Father God, may your spirit roam freely around this room. The gospel has been shared. You tell us in your word that when we exalt Jesus, you'll draw all men unto you. Jesus, we exalt you today. We ask you to do the impossible. That right now, God, you would say, You would say for those that have already surrendered to you, Father, give them courage to not be ashamed and to publicly proclaim that you are their Savior and Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand to your feet right now. Would you do that?